For I will give you your words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some, uh, put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Joy to the world. No more election news coverage and political ads. <laughs> Maybe this isn't the good news you were expecting to hear this morning, but this morning, isn't it a relief to have a break from all of that? I know, I don't know about you, but the election process was making me feel really worn down. <laughs> Some of us are very excited. The candidate of our choice won and we are happy. We want to celebrate. Others of us are disappointed that our candidate lost. We want to mourn. We are afraid. We aren't feeling very celebratory. But how can we all find hope together in this? Perhaps we need to recognize that God is active in everything that is going on today. God is present in the midst of fear and disappointment, as well as exuberance and joy. Then we come to this reading from Luke about stones crumbling and wars and other disasters, and I had difficulty at first finding good news to share. But when I look beyond my post-election stress disorder, I realize that this passage in Luke comes just when we need it. This gospel passage is an example of apocalyptic literature at its best. Descriptions of wars, natural disasters, persecutions, and imprisonments are peppered throughout. But it is not about the end of the world. In fact, the word apocalypse doesn't refer to end times as we often think it does. It refers to revelation, specifically God revealing himself to us in a direct visionary way. So this is not, a ne not necessarily a passage about the end of the world, but we'd still like to know the ending. We want a timetable. And the disciples were like us in that respect. They wanted answers. So it isn't surprising when Jesus starts talking about the way things will be at the end of the age, his disciples want to know when, Lord, how will we know? What will be the sign that these things are about to take place? To put today's reading into perspective, we need to backtrack a little. A couple weeks ago, Jesus was still on his way to Jerusalem, a journey that began back in chapter 9 of Luke's Gospel. We have followed him along the way and, enlist, and listened along with his disciples as he taught about the kingdom of God. While we weren't looking, though, Jesus arrived in Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna and waving palm branches. Yes, today's lesson puts us smack in the middle of Holy Week in Luke. Within a few days in the biblical text, Jesus will complete his journey to the cross, where he will die for our sins. Jesus spends much of his, this final week in or near the temple, and worshiping and teaching his disciples. It might be helpful to understand a bit more about this temple in Jerusalem, the place where faithful Jews came to worship and the center of Jewish identity. Remember that Solomon had built the first temple. It had been a, very, a thing of grandeur. Grandeur, excuse me. Solomon's temple replaced the tabernacle that had accompanied the Israelites on their 40-year journey to the Promised Land. God's presence filled the temple, just as it had filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord was real and evident to the people of Jerusalem. Excuse me, of Israel. But they did not stay faithful to God. First, the nation of Israel was divided. And then, when the people continued to ignore God, they were carried off to Babylon. Solomon's temple was destroyed and left as a heap of rubble. It was out of that rubble that Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt the temple when they returned from exile. However, the presence of God, the glory of God, did not fill that temple as it had before. Fast forward a few centuries to Herod the Great. 
Herod was known both for his brutality and for his building projects. Even though Herod may have considered himself of Jewish faith, he was not considered Jewish by the Jews of Judea, particularly Pharisees. Herod was li little more than a puppet king serving Rome and his own ego, with more devotion than he offered to God. His greatest building project, the temple at Jerusalem, was more of a monument to himself than to the Lord of Abraham and Isaac. And it is, is quite a monument. Herod had leveled the old temple and had laid a, few, a new foundation of stone so immense that some weighed well over 100 tons. <coughs> the temple gleamed from the top of Mount Moriah, white stone and gold making it up every visible surface. Just as there is no record of God's glory filling the, te the reconstructed temple of Ezra and Nehemiah, we have no indication that God's presence was ever evident in Herod's temple. So we need to keep in mind that as far as the disciples were concerned, excuse me, <coughs> Jesus is only talking about the destruction of the structure, Herod's temple, not the end of the world as we know it. Luke wrote his gospel 20 years after the temple had been destroyed so Jesus, to show Jesus giving an amazing prophetic message to people who didn't know yet what they needed to know. And it's also a message for us. People realize that structures and leadership can and will fail. Jesus tells those admiring the splendor of the temple that one day soon this temple will fall. No stone will be left on top of another. And this means a shift in the way Israel worships. If there is no temple, then where will they sacrifice? If there is no temple, where can they go to be near the Holy of Holies? If there is no temple, their entire way of life must change. Not only does Jesus tell them there will be no temple, but that before that happens, there will be war, there will be earthquakes, there will be famine, there will be signs in the heavens. Things will be more unstable than ever before. Every time the media brings us news of another disaster, we may wonder, is this the end, Lord? Earthquakes, hurricanes that wipe out entire coastlines, floods and wildfires that drive people from their homes. And those are just the natural disasters. We've also seen many pictures of war's destruction in Ukraine. Where beautiful buildings and plazas once stood, there is now only rubble. But Jesus says, the end is not yet. And Jesus says, do not be terrified. This word terrified only appears twice in the entire New Testament. Here and in chapter 24, verse 37, as Luke describes the reaction of disciples to the risen Christ because they think he is a ghost. Other things throughout the gospel, uh, other places, excuse me, throughout the gospel, we are encouraged to stop being afraid, especially when we encounter God working among us. <clears throat> As Jesus listens, suffering his, his followers will, can expect, being terrified might sound like a reasonable reaction. You will face persecution. You will be hunted down for your faith by the religious leaders and civic leaders. You will be put in chains. None of this sounds like good news, does it? Then we get to verse 13, and we learn why we can look forward to such suffering. It will give us an opportunity to testify. All of this will happen so that we can tell the good news of Jesus Christ, not after we survived our suffering, but right smack dab in the middle of it. Jesus be, will be with us, giving us the testimony. We need to bear witness to God. Maybe you only think of giving testimony to your faith as sharing the good news that have that have, sharing good news about things that have, have happened, sharing about a healing, sharing about a bad thing turned good, and those are important things to share. But I think the kind of testifying Jesus is referring to here is in the midst of the storm, no end in sight testimony testimony. This is a kind of testimony that acknowledges God is God, no matter what the world may look like. And Jesus also says, when we are called to testify because of our faith, we don't need to prepare an elaborate speech because we will, he will give us words and a wisdom that our opponents will not be able to contradict. Stand firm to the end, Jesus says, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. How can we endure? 
Jesus is not telling us that we must do this by our own strength or by our own force of will. If we want to endure through hardships, we must place our trust completely in God and depend on him. We can endure because we are children of God, com completely dependent on God's grace alone. Our reading from Thessalonians today says, Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Doing the right thing can be tough. Tough to discern, tough to put in practice, and tough to practice consistently. Staying the course and using critical thinking to discern the right paths, these are skills not often taught or prized by our culture. And many do become weary of doing right. There's compassion fatigue, which afflicts many who give much of themselves. Well-meaning, passionate individuals can fall prey to cynicism and become disillusioned when desired outcomes don't mater materialize. The wide, well-trodden paths of denial and avoidance look much more navigable than the torturous climb to the mountaintop in pursuit of truth and justice. The good news is we can celebrate that we are not alone in the journey. Jesus knows our struggle. When folks are fractious and seek to divide the community and the church, we do well to remember Paul's words to a community divided over, over practice and possibility. In the face of such dissent and agitation, many Thessalonian disciples found it difficult to persevere. Paul reminds them that perseverance and focus will yield good works and a strong community, not grumbling and chaos. It is in the very midst of the world's chaos and destruction that we as disciples find an oasis of hope and peace in Christian community and in journeying, journeying together. Jesus assures his disciples that no matter what comes their way, their perseverance and faith will see them through. God will not abandon God's own. As Luther once said, if he knew the world was coming to an end today, he would plant a tree. No matter what the circumstance may be, we need to be actively pursuing ways to make the world a better place. As Paul writes elsewhere, the only thing that counts is faith working through love. We are to stay focused on our faith in God, a faith that makes, that, which is made active through love. We, we do this not to save ourselves, but in response to God's mercy for us. In the 1950s, a traditional African-American spiritual emerged as a song of comfort expressing God's providence. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the itty-bitty baby in his hands. He's got you and me brother in his hands. He's got you and me sister in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. In today's gospel, Jesus warns about wars and earthquakes, famines and plagues, dreadful omens, and great signs from heaven. And then he encourages his peers, do not worry about it. I have your back. It will all turn out well. I will even make it an opportunity for you to testify. Everything is in God's hands. By God's mercy, we will be delivered from anything that would threaten us in this temporary world we are in. By that same mercy, we will be given life without end in the next. And this, my friends, is the good news. Amen.
as you are able. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died in the Spirit. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the United with your saints across time and place, we pray for our shared world, responding, Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our prayer. Reviving God, keep your church active in its mission and ministry. Encourage bishops, deacons, pastors, and lay leaders to risk boldly in their proclamation and fill them with wisdom and endurance for, challenging, for the challenging times. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. prayer. Renewing God, as the northern hemisphere prepares for winter, make us mindful of the order of beauty of your creation. Teach us to treasure cycles of rest and new life. Help us care for what you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, accompany all who make sacrifices for the sake of others. Safeguard first responders and active duty military personnel. Grant peace to veterans and heal any wounds in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Healing God, your people cry out to you. Sustain doctors, nurses, and hospital personnel in their tireless work. Uphold mental health professionals and those in their care. May the sun of righteousness rise on all who are sick, struggling, or in need of your mercy. Especially, we pray for Preston, Tina, Tammy, and those on our prayer list. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uniting God, unite this assembly in its shared mission and ministry for the sake of the gospel. Highlight ways we can work together and give us patience to work through disagreement. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Consoling God, abide with all who grieve for loved ones who have died. Comfort us with the promise of your resurrection and new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept these prayers, gracious God, and those known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our life, the life our Lord offered for us, and believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with, this, with us the great and promised feast. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray the words our Lord gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou hast the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and and join us in the feast. All is ready. <clears throat> the body of Christ given for you. of Christ given for you. The body 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 of Christ given for you.
body of Christ given for you. The blood of, the blood of Christ shed for you. Please stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, most gracious God, that you have fed us with the bread of heaven and given us a foretaste of the feast to come. Enliven us to be your body in the world and to serve those who are in need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.
God of peace, who creates all things and calls them good, who makes all of us alive in Jesus, and who breathes on us the spirit of hope, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Be a blessing to the world. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank <laughs> you.